welcome all to the 2023-24 uh, Oakland Early Learning Symposium. My name is Maria Suho, and I'm the Director of Kindergarten Readiness at Oakland Unified School District. I'm excited to be here with you all. This is one of my favorite topics. Early childhood ed has been um, very near and dear to my heart my entire career. Start off as a preschool teacher, administrator, and now an adjunct in early learning. So for me, spending a Wednesday night with like-minded early childhood education champions that want to think about how to improve outcomes for young children in Oakland is a pleasure. Okay, and over the last four years of hosting the symposium in person and in 2019 and then online throughout the pandemic, Oakland Starting Strong and Smart has had amazing support and participation from the wider Oakland early care and education community. We've had over 1,000 unique participants join us over the, four, the last four years, and we hope that you've gotten as much out of these events as we have. A reminder that all of tonight's participants are also invited to attend an in-person companion event at Bananas in Oakland on Saturday, uh, November 11th from 10 to noon. We'll be giving away a book of um, children's books related to the topics that we're gonna cover today. There's gonna be goodies and of course, breakfast. Um, there's no formal program for this event. You can drop any time between, between uh, 10 and noon. And this is just an opportunity for you to network, meet some folks, have breakfast with us, and uh, just be in community with all of us. If you have not already, already registered for this event, please do so by clicking on the link in the chat. And just a note, you must attend the event to receive the free giveaways. We're not able to deliver them at all alternative times to folks. So please uh, come through on Saturday, 10 to noon. The event on Saturday is an example of how throughout the community, throughout, throughout the pandemic, we've tried to find ways to support the early learning community in Oakland. Another effort is called the Let's Talk Early Learning Events. Um, and these are on Zoom sessions that are informal ways for you to get to know other early learning professionals and talk about subjects that are top of mind in this field. The next one is this Monday, December 11th at 6 p.m. And the discuss discussion will be focused on inclusion. So give it a try. We have our fantastic, fantastic educators that um, I just adore seeing at work and in this space, Ms. Jaquetta Wallace, Yvonne Garcia, Annette Wright, and Nini, um, Nini Humphreys. If you're here, say hello to us in the chat. And let's see. We will be sending out a link um, to this event, so look out for it in your email. Um, so our topic for tonight is child development in the new now. Young children and families have been impacted by the pandemic in many ways. And as a result, we're seeing this in how children show up and have different needs in our care in different ways than they did in previous years. Tonight, we're gonna explore these needs, how to address them, and we're hoping that you leave with some practic practical tools on how to address these common challenges that we're seeing in our field in childcare and in preschool settings. Now for some background and some meeting housekeeping, we're gonna turn it over to Vince Chang from First Five Alameda County, who's gonna be co-moderating with me. Vince? Hi, thank you, Maria, um, and welcome everybody. It's really great to see everybody. And thank you again for being here. Um, again, my name is Vincent Chang and I work at First Five Alameda County. I'm one of our program administrators focusing on early care and education partnerships. So we're gonna start, um, we're gonna start off tonight hearing first from four speakers, and then we will be going into breakout rooms to share and expand on what we learned at around 7.30. But before we begin, I just want to share some housekeeping items for this meeting. We'll have a specific time for questions for speakers after they have all concluded. If you have a question during the question and answer, please use the raise hand feature by clicking on the reactions button and clicking raise hand option below the emoji. You can also ask questions in the chat. We'll do our best to answer all questions, but some may need some follow-up. This meeting is being recorded and will be shared widely. So please keep that in mind as you participate. As we go through our presentations, you do not need your video on, but please turn them on during the breakout sessions happening later in this event. The breakouts are not gonna be recorded. We know many of you joining us today will be receiving professional development credits 
and those certificates will be emailed out to you right after today's event. We'll also be sending out resources shared tonight in an email, so check your inboxes. We want to begin our session by recognizing historical injustices. Please take a moment to locate the native land that you are on right now by going to the link that we will put in the chat. After you do that, or if you already know, please take a moment and add the land you are on right now to the chat. I'm in Oakland, which is the native land of Muwekma, Miwok, Ohlone, and Confederated villages of Least John. We would also like to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country was built. We remember that our country was built on the labor of enslaved people, primarily of African descent, and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant and indigenous labor who contributed to the building of this country and continue to serve within our labor force. We acknowledge the labor inequities and shared responsibilities for combating oppressive systems in our daily work. Okay, thank you so much for participating in that land and labor acknowledgement. I'm now pleased to introduce our first speaker tonight, Kakima Bunch Smith, who is the founder and CEO of Anasa LLC, a consulting firm based in Brooklyn, New York where she does executive and leadership coaching, professional development, and speaking engagement. Takima is also an adjunct assistant professor at New York University's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, and she is a former executive director of the Center on Culture, Race, and Equity at the Bank Street College of Education. Takima has spent much of her career in the early childhood education space. And we are so happy that she's joining us tonight to give us some perspective on how we can approach child development in the new now. Welcome to Kima and take it away, please. Thank you so much, Vince. And thank you for that beautiful land and labor acknowledgement. Um, it's important that we keep, uh, keep these things in mind as we are doing our work and living. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me. If you can't, please let me know. Uh, my, This is a picture, it will move forward. I have a song that goes with it um, and it's a soca song from Michelle Montano. And I just love this part where he says, we're vibrating on a high frequency, vibrating on a high energy. And I just love the energy of early childhood. And I know that we vibrate and we need to keep doing that in order to do the work that we're doing. So the title of this, you know, this symposium is Child Development in the New Now. And so on the next slide, I came up with something that I thought might kind of get us into it. This ain't exactly what we signed up for, or is it? Um, <laughs> I have a lot of early childhood folks in my life. I work with them. I love them. I live with them. Um, and uh, people have been talking a lot about just how challenging the last uh, few years have been. And um, interestingly, if we dig deeper, I think for a long time, things have been challenging. So I want to just have us take a few minutes to think a little bit more expansively about our work and our purpose. And so I want to start by telling you a story. So on the next slide, you'll see some beautiful, uh, beautiful children as I share a quick story. So 20, 20 years ago in 2003, I was an instructor at a local community college in New York City. And one of the first assignments I would always give my ECE 101 students, the foundational course, was to write a one page early childhood philosophy statement. So invariably, every year that I did this, I would collect them all. And the first sentence or the second sentence was usually some variation on this idea. I want to teach children because I love children. So I actually would then return every single paper back to them and ask them to rewrite it. I'm gonna ask you to be involved by using the chat since there are so many of us we can't unmute easily. Um, why do you think I would return these philosophy statements back to these foundation students when they said, I wanna teach because I love children? Just take a moment and type into the chat. No wrong answers. What do you think? It's 
Sonini is the first one I see who said I wanted them to go deeper. And Fanny said, think twice. What else? Mm. Robin, so they can remember that initial thought as a grounding in a North Star in the tough times. Yes. And Marla, why do you love children? And Leanne, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I hope you said it's more than just love. And Paige, loving is not sometimes enough. Loving children, it's limited. What is the actual reason why or reasons why you want to teach? Exactly. So you're absolutely right about that. And I remember their stunned faces because they felt really good about, well, I love children. And I kind of said to them, that's the baseline. Um, I would hope that you went into early childhood because you love children. And then I would find out that some people said, well, I'm in early childhood because I didn't get into nursing. So then I will admit that then I would have really um, com you know, important conversations with them about being in the exact place that they wanted to be and not, right, <laughs> choose early childhood, right? Don't let it be a default. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment, and I love that you're continuing to add in the chat, so please keep doing that. Um, as because I don't have a lot of time and I'm going to probably ask you a lot of questions and invite your thoughts. Um, and so I want you on the next slide to just start to dig in and think about your why, right? Your why. Why did you go into this field, you? What was your vision of the impact that you thought you would have through your work with children and families? And also, what did you imagine your days would be filled with or would look like? So we have a chat that we can use absolutely, but trying to be as interactive as possible. I have something called a Padlet that we can also add our thoughts to. So on the next slide, there'll be a QR code. Now, you know how we are with technology today. You can take your phone and put the camera up and the QR code should take you to a website. Um, that is a Padlet website, and it'll have those three questions that I just read. Now, if that feels too complicated for people, you can totally add your thoughts into the chat. That's fine as well. We also have the Padlet link that went into the chat. Thank you so much, Priya. So I'm going to now ask if Jackie can unshare and just take us to the Padlet so I can show you how it works, if that feels okay, or if you can pull it up. Right. So this is what it looks like when you go. And then there should be a little, sorry, I have to make the screen a little bigger. It's a red circle with a plus sign on the bottom. Um, but I'm sorry, the plus signs under each question. So these are three questions. You don't have to answer all three. You can pick one. What drew you into the field? When you click on that plus sign, a little sticky comes up and then you can write it. So I'd love for you to take a moment. If there's something that just jumps out at you, wait, I know what drew me into the field. Just write it down. Um, if there is like your vision of your impact, you can go ahead and add that. And we're just going to take a moment to make sure that people can start adding. I see some things coming up already. I love us. We're so quick, quick learners. Um, and then the last one was, what did you imagine your days would be filled with or would look like when you got into the field? All right. So go ahead. And I see us adding. Thank you so much. And for those who want to add into the chat, you totally can as well. Thank you, Victoria. Every moment is a teachable moment. As a secondary parent to the child, it can be both challenging and fulfilling. So let's keep adding to the Padlet if possible and in the chat if that's not your favorite so far. And then we can go back to the slides, Jackie. Thank you so much, Jackie. I know we're going back and forth a little bit. Okay. So as you're continuing to think about your why, what drew you into the field of early childhood, what your vision was of the impact that you would have, and what you imagined your days would be filled with and what they would look like, um, just keep those things in mind and keep adding to the Padlet. We're going to move into, you know, this baby is showing us something. These babies are showing us something, right? So some of you are wondering, but I think many of you have an inkling as to why I've asked you to reground yourselves and to remember what brought you into this moment of doing the most sacred work of anyone in our society. You are supporting children beginning at birth 
and throughout their most critical years of life. We don't need research to tell us, but research tells us we know this. The sacred work that you're doing extends to supporting and partnering with their caregivers and their families when they themselves are also at their most vulnerable and arguably, arguably their most stress-filled moments of their lives. Caregivers entrust you with their most precious gifts often before their children can even talk or communicate directly about their needs. That is a huge, probably the biggest trust moment of anyone's life. So now here we are in 2023, and you might be feeling like this is actually the hardest moment in your career, and with good reason. So again, going back into the chat, what are some things that are making your work with young children and families feel challenging at this moment in time? So this one, we're gonna be back in the chat. I'm keeping you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> after a full day of work, right? So what's making your work in early childhood feel challenging right now? You don't have to write a whole dissertation. You can just put a few things in there. Thank you for people writing in Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. So what might be making you feel challenged? Mm -hmm. We have some things coming up, a lack of staffing, parents and admin, lack of staff is a theme I see, feeling powerless about staffing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. children coming to school sick, yes, parents feel more difficult, the needs of children during the pandemic, my teachers are burnt out and overworked, right, the pandemic especially, and we know how hard early childhood folks were working before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic came, my goodness. Um, and here we are in the strange post, but maybe not pandemic world, right? Yes. And children bringing into the classroom trauma and hardships from home, illnesses, media, cultural differences. There's so many things. There's so many of, on, of you here that I can't read through all of them, but I do want to um, just show you. So the photos after will reference that, right? So the next uh, slides are about just, all right, I love this baby because the baby's like, what's going on, right? It's kind of just as hard for me as it is for you. And then when you go to the next slide, I, I don't know that we are paying enough attention to this, what about your exhaustion and burnout and tired, right? Are you all getting access to the seven types of rest that are necessary? Physical rest, mental rest, spiritual rest, emotional rest, sensory rest, social rest, and creative rest. I'm going to put a link into the chat with an article that you can take a look at to help you and the folks that you work with kind of reorient around what does rest really look like in this moment. Okay, so as we go into the next part of this, I can't believe how quickly time is going. Um, on the next slide is just, we're gonna talk about a few ideas that I wanna offer you, some mindset shifts that are based on a framework that I started to create joyful and liberated lives in early childhoods and organizations. And so there are three things that I want to pose that we can use to help ourselves get through this tough moment and actually all the tough moments that are gonna keep coming because that's what it is to do the work that we do. So the first one, if you go to the next slide, please, Jackie, is to recreate or create your mission. How often do we sit down and say, why am I doing this work? Not with our head in our hands saying, why am I doing this work? But really, when you got started, what was your big, hairy, audacious goal, right? What were you thinking about for children and families in this field? What is the difference that you wanted to make? Every single day that you show up to work, you're actually taking steps towards fulfilling that mission, even when it doesn't feel like you're doing that. So how do we reground ourselves? How do we say this work is bigger than me? It's what we do together and we can and we will continue to do it even when things feel hard and even when we don't feel like we have the resources. If you haven't thought about your mission or your why in a long time, like if this is the first time in a couple of years or longer, why don't you limit to after this, taking out some paper or Google Doc get to writing and reflecting, and then come back to it. Don't just leave this and be like, okay, I have my mission. Come back to it tomorrow. Go back to it on Monday. Talk about it with folks. Yeah. Is it if you need to. 
I know, and I've seen this happen, it gives people strength when you need it most. It inspires you and it makes you smile actually when you see the fruits of your labor come to life because you will realize even when things are challenging, there are so many things that are working about what I'm doing. Every day when I show up, it's supporting children and families. So that's one important thing. The next thing that I want you to think about is innovating for equity. If we go to the next slide, these are just the words that I'm saying. Um, I want to remind us that early childhood people are the ones that will often be able to find the solutions to our challenges. And so we're the ones that want to think outside of the box so that we can give children and families and each other what we need to thrive. What we do also will push the early childhood feel forward, including policymakers, right? They need to hear from what is happening on the ground so that they can make better policies and align resources that we need to be able to function at our optimal. So I know lots of you have come on tonight and you've come up with creative solutions to problems that might have actually seemed unsolvable at first. Really, really quick example of this is that I have done executive and leadership coaching with uh, an executive director and assistant director at Bowdoin Children's Center in Maine. They've been at their wits end um, trying to figure out staffing challenges. That sounds a little familiar based on what I've just seen in the chat, right? So they were trying to figure out how do they get more seasoned staff because people were leaving, people were moving, people were choosing other, other careers, and the work was feeling really exhausting to everybody. So instead of just trying to do the same things, right, put the ads up, get the same people, have them stay for a moment and leave, they actually spent a little time looking at the challenges, right, figuring out what were our specific staffing challenges with people leaving, but also those who were staying. So they actually talked to staff about what was going on. They figured out some root causes, and then they came up with some ideas about how to redistribute work with the people there, and then how to bring new people in to this new system. So they got all this feedback from staff and then they implemented it this past summer. And the report as of today was that everyone is so much happier and people are choosing to come there because they feel like they have a mentorship approach and a way of growing in that space. And so this little story just reminds us that we can choose to think within a box, we can think outside of the box, but we're early childhood people. How about we don't have any boxes? right? How about we just think expansively and creatively? And some things will be impossible, but you'd be surprised. You may be able to find some really creative solutions to our, your challenges, and then you have to share them with each other. So that's the next part is just to connect for hope, right? What we do is difficult. If we go to the next slide, we'll see this connection slide. What we do is challenging. We talk about burnout. We talk about problems. When are we talking about the things that are working? When are we connecting with each other? When we when are we connecting within our programs and in our homes when we're doing family child care and then outside of that? Tonight's a great example. I see people with your cameras off. You're probably doing a million things, but you're listening in. Someone mentioned being in a hospital, but you are here because connection is what matters and sustains us for all the work that we do for children. You are not alone. You need the positive energy, the information, the ideas, and to be able to share your stories and be heard and to listen to other people. So hope, joy, connection, and play always will sustain us when things are hard and they'll lift us higher when things are going well. I did say play because in my experience, early childhood adults in the field do not play. We will love to support children to play, but how have you played? When have you last played? What does that look like? So I want you all to commit to and um, connect to hope often and boldly and without reservation, you deserve to play. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was just go back to the Padlet and see if there was uh, some more writing that, well, lots of things, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you. I love also multitasking is the big thing. So what drew you to early childhood, the legacy of being in a family of early of educators, um, someone talking about their own childhood not being easy and wanting to make a difference to show children that they matter, their voices matter, their their feelings matter, knowing that children are fun and curious, wonderful. 
um, my Spanish, I decided to work with children because it's my passion and because I learned everything about with love and patience. Okay, forgive me for my <laughs> Spanish on the spot. It's not so good, but thank you. Um, and if someone can translate that in the chat, that would be amazing. Um, so the vision, advocacy, sustainability, inclusion, accessibility, children are learning new skills every day. They may not be coming in generally as a group where they were before the pandemic, but that doesn't mean that they're not still growing and learning. And so we understand that our job is always to meet children where they are and to meet families where they are and to always have a strength-based perspective. We can easily as a society focus on all the things that kids don't have or families don't have, but the real challenge is how do we say, this is what you do have and this is how I'm gonna support you to grow. That's actually the work that we're here to do. So thank you so much. This is so beautiful. And just imagine that all of you are here. So many of you have very similar ideas and experiences and concerns. So what would happen if we all committed to synergy where we said, I'm not going to try to do this on my own. I'm actually going to do this in community because synergy is about us having a bigger impact when we are together in community working towards a goal. So that's a challenge that I have for us all to keep the connections going beyond tonight and take all the learning that you're going to get from the subsequent speakers and the connections you're going to make in the breakout room. And the challenge is, how do you keep going after tonight? That is what you need. And that was that is what um, children need. So here's a last uh, quick thing for us to take a look at. Uh, we're going to go back to the slides, please. Thank you. And then so the last slide, uh, please, has a quick uh, video. And let's take a look. We have to unmute the volume. Yeah. Little moments to find joy in the in-between. Not every moment is full of happiness and light. But there's a crack of joy seeping in if only you look. And we can all make the world just a little better by finding that joy and embracing it. Go out into the world today and find those little moments of joy. Maybe even create some of your own. It might just shift your perspective. But remember... God so thank you. So just remember, if not you, then who? We are magic, you are magic, and you are doing incredible work for children. So stay encouraged and learn as much as you can, connect as much as you can tonight and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. This Takina. is how you can stay in touch with me. <laughs> so I forgot about that slide. So if you wanna take a screenshot, I'll put my info in the chat and I'll be here as well um, to answer any questions or engage with folks. Thank you so much, Vince. Yeah. Thank you, Takima. I think I'm going to go find some joy and play this weekend myself. Um, so after our next speaker, we're going to have a question and answer period. So in the meantime, if you do have a burning question, please go ahead and put it in the chat. The chemo will be uh, reviewing and responding as we transition to our next speaker. So every year, the organizers of this symposium reach out to early learning professionals to find out what topics are on top of your mind. This fall, we heard that since the pandemic, there were specific issues related to child development that seemed to be showing up more in classrooms than ever before. This included more children and families struggling with separ separation anxiety, and also more children needing assistance with toilet training. So our next speaker is Tarsha Jordan. Tarsha is the owner of the Kindergarten Readiness Academy in Oakland is run through her family child care program. She is a former principal, the author of several children's books, and a member of the Oakland Family Child Care Policy Committee. Tarsha is going to talk today about separation anxiety and how she works with families to overcome it. I'm going to hand it over to you, Tarsha. Thank you, Vince. Good evening, everyone. And I also want to say thank you to Takima. That was a wonderful presentation. And I was over here taking copious notes. I will be reaching out to you. So this evening, I have the wonderful opportunity to discuss with you 
navigating separation anxiety. We have a slide here and it gives you an idea of the different points that I will touch on this evening. Please feel welcome to enter questions or comments in the chat if you wanna give thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways. If you have other questions, feel free to include that here. So again, thank you so much. I enjoy music. I think music is a language that everybody on every continent can relate to. And so we're gonna start our presentation off with a song. And I want you to sit for just a few seconds when you hear this song and think about where you were when this song was so popular. How old were you? What were you doing? It's the song that I think many of us know. Do you remember that song? Oh, Tarsha, I think we couldn't hear the audio on that. Do you mind? You can't hear it? So sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I hope that you're hearing that now, or did you hear a little bit of it? It was the Sesame Street theme song. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we all, or many of us grew up listening to. It's something that takes us back to a time when we were much, much younger. And I want you to think about how it felt at that time to separate from mommy our daddy, our grandma, our grandpa, as you went to school, or perhaps you went to the after school program. Are you having a hard time hearing me? We can hear you fine. Okay, great. So with that being in mind, all of us were children, young children at one time. And for those of us whose memory still serves us, I'm sure that we can think of a time when we were very anxious about being separated from our parents, from our caregivers. And what did that feel like? So can you remember a time such as that? And if you can't think back that far, can you think of something that you had to separate from recently or someone that you separated from recently and how that felt? Something that you're used to being around, something that brings you comfort and then it's not there. That might be your Starbucks one morning if the line is too long. That might be having to go away to work for a week and leaving your family. It could be any sort of things. But I think what we have to remember, and one of the points that I really want to make, is that young children are the earlier versions of us. So they're little bitty adults. And their experiences are experiences that we've all had at one time and that we can relate to right now. So when we're talking about empowering our children during separation anxiety, what does that look like? Sakima mentioned the pandemic and some of the changes that transpired during that time, many of which we're still experiencing. So when we're thinking about children, children who were at home with their parents or their caregivers because they couldn't go to school or they couldn't go to daycare or they had no place else to go, or maybe their families chose to keep them home. Think about the extra bonding that took place during that time. And as we've come out of the pandemic, what have we seen? We've seen children who've gone back to school and their tantrums are tremendous. Educators are saying, you know, trying to get Aaliyah back into the swing of things 
is a little bit challenging. She's crying in the morning. When mommy drops her off, mommy's crying in the morning. Well, that tells us that it's not only the children who are experiencing anxiety, the adults are too, and the parents. So what can we do to empower our children? I hope you're thinking of things, and maybe many of you have strategies that you use all of the time. Does that look like having a song on in the morning when the children come in, whether it's to the classroom or into your daycare? What are you doing to make the atmosphere inviting and relaxing for them? Because what we're really looking at is social emotional support here. They're gaining their independence. They want to be independent. It's an eight. They want to be on their own. They want to make their own choices. They want to make their own decisions. But then when the time comes to separate, what does that look like? Are you hearing a lot of screaming? Are you seeing people, little people falling out on the floor? Are you seeing children that are clinging on to their parents, holding on to their legs, reaching for them? and just crying their little eyes out, almost to the point where it even breaks your heart. What are you doing to help calm the situation? So when we're looking at this, we have to be really creative. There's a lot of research that's been done as to things that we can do. I see somebody put Parents Come Back, the Daniel Tiger song. Absolutely. And I have that on the list here to share with you. Thank you for sharing that. Can I sing the Sesame Street song? Um, well, maybe at the end, if we have time, I'll try that. If you all sing along with me. But there are different things that are calming for little people. Things like little windmills. Can you blow the windmill? I'll blow it with you. Let's take a deep breath and let's exhale. And what does that look like? And how does that feel? And does it take the attention off of the anxiety that they're feeling? Yes, it's a mindfulness tool. One that's used with little children also. We sometimes say, take a deep breath and let it out. But when you add something like this, it makes it even more calming, even more interesting. Maybe you'll do the breathing exercise with your bubble wand. And you know, it's even better when you have the whole class do it together because it's like you're not singling out the one or two or three students who may be having this challenge in terms of separating from their adult a good book that you can read with the children is Mommy Always Comes Back to You. And that book is for students who are zero to five years old. Once you get into your class time, reading them a story, talking about mommy, using the language, building the vocabulary. Mommy, mommy may have driven off in the car, but she's going to drive back in the car to pick you up at the end of the day and include the other students in this conversation. Will your mommy come back? Robert, yesterday, did your mommy come back and pick you up? Include them so that their, their classmates start to feel the warmth that they're feeling about their mommy's coming back, or daddy, or granny, somebody's coming to pick them up. They're not going to be left there alone. You may have to result to including some other friends, some little stick puppets in the morning as a part of your welcome. Maybe each student would have their own puppet and during circle time or right after hanging things up at the cubby, you incorporate the puppets. Our hand puppets are always our very best friends for us educators because they can say things in a way that young people understand and appreciate and feel more comfortable with. So we have to look for strategies that we can use right now in real time to support our students. We have to use a lot of language with them, but the language needs to be reinforcing. We have to remember that it's just not anxiety. We are helping them 
to gain their independence, but we're also supporting them on this journey of social emotional development, which is huge. And what about the parents? What about the parents that are in tears or upset or hanging around or they're asking, can I just stay a little while? Or, you know, I'll just wait out here. I'm sure you've all seen them. Some of you, you probably won't admit it, but some of you may have been one of those parents. So what do we do for the parents? Takima mentioned self-help and doing things to empower ourselves so we feel better. So how can we combine that with navigating this separation anxiety? What would that look like? The parents need to feel comfortable. They need to know that they are welcome, that they are a part of this learning process, but they need to understand very clearly that this, this is a time when we need to grant the little people the space to grow. It's going to hurt to walk away and hear them crying. We understand. But, you know, maybe maybe mommy would like to come back early today and pick Aaliyah up early for a couple of days. Pick her up early and we'll just add more time. I see someone saying, send pictures of the children in the classroom. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the most empowering things that you can do is have a family wall where the children can see a picture of themselves with their parents or their grandparents. And they can visit that wall throughout the day. And if they go to that wall and they're crying, if you or your aide could go over with them and say, oh, hi, John, is this a picture of you with your grandpa? What's, what, what's your grandpa's name? Or who is this in this picture? We're going to redirect their anxiety by empowering them with understanding that we understand that your family, your parent, your grandparent has left for a little while, but they're coming back. And in the meantime, you're here with us and we are going to take care of you. We're going to support you. You are not alone. You are in good hands. But I also want to just touch on this little factor also. While we want to empower the parents to be able to walk away from the school setting, we want to make sure that they feel comfortable. We have to create opportunities for them to be a part of this space. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to have family night. Well, you know, we're getting ready for the Thanksgiving holiday. We're going to have a family meal here. We're going to have a small performance and, you know, each child can invite three adults. So if that's mommy, daddy, and one grandparent, oh, yeah, 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 your 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 dad lives out of state and he'll be here um, in January. Well, we'll have opportunities for him to come. You know, we'll be doing an activity preparing for gardening because spring is coming and we'll be doing some things. We'd love to have him come and visit. And by then, you know, our children will have hopefully gained their sense of independence and understanding that whoever dropped us off this morning, they're coming back to get us. We want to make sure that our parents feel comfortable leaving their children with us. But we also want to tell parents not to ignore anxiety. So we're not saying just brush it off. We want to make sure that the parents are communicating with their children, that at home, the parents are using the same language that we're using in class. And that's something that should be shared. What's the vocabulary that you're using? What are you saying? We're saying mommy and daddy will come back. So at home over dinner or in the car on the way home, you can say mommy and daddy will come back. Empowering the families, we want them to know, to be able to say, okay, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're all in this together. We're building a foundation together. We are empowering our students. We are working together. We are planning activities together and we are supporting you. But we have to separate to allow them to gain their independence. 
Please grant them the space to grow. And remember, you are not alone. Thank you so much for this time. I've enjoyed being with all of you this evening. OSSS, this has been awesome. And thank you again. Wow, thank you so much, Tarsha. What an empathetic and caring way to respond to children and their families. I wish you would have been my preschool teacher. <laughs> Thank you so much. Some very informative tips at, for working with young children and their families. So if you have any questions for Tarsha, please put them in the chat. If you have any shout outs, compliments for her, put them there as well. And uh, we will also have some time for Q&A. So make sure to keep those questions close to your brain. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from our last speakers, Vivian Levias, who is an early childhood instructor at the Brookfield City of Oakland Head Start site and Maria Victoria, or Vicky Zuniga, who is an early childhood instructor and currently with the home-based program at the City of Oakland Head Start. So Vivian and Vicky are going to share some tips on toilet training. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um. Yes. Um. I think uh, for me uh, is the most the most important is the first impression you give to the parents at the beginning. Um, we try to give them to make them feel comfortable and to let them know that they are welcoming and that we are there for their we are there for them to help wherever they need with. Um, something that I always let them know is that they are the primary teacher of the, the child and uh, it's okay if the child is not body trained, we're going to help them and we're going to encourage the child and we're going to support whatever they, they need, they, we need to do with, with him. Another thing um, that I always let them know is that um, every child is different and they learn in different style and different way, different time, and it's okay. So la I remember one of the, we used to have a girl last year that um, every time when she come to the center, she had a diaper on it. So um, I observed her that as soon as she come in, she take off her diaper and she put on a um, underwear that we have extra clothes in there. So I observed her twi two, twice and I spoke to the mom and I let her know that the child was ready for a uh, get up um, the diaper. So mom was concerned about that she had an accident during the traveling time to the school. And I told her that it's okay. Sometimes accidents happen and give her a, a a chance, right? So I encourage the mom to to just uh, give her a power of her body and um, I think for less than a month that child was ready um, for party train. So one of the things is just to give the opportunity to the child to have um, the power on her, their own body because they are little people that they know what to do, right? So um, before we met the family at the beginning of the school year, we already have a picture of the family and a picture of the child because the uh, family advocate have to do uh, the intake. This where they collect all the information about the child, the development, the, the uh, family environment, everything. So we already know what to say, what to help, what to do with the family. But even though um, we give them respect at the beginning of the school year and we ask them, what are the goals do you want for the child? So if they don't mention about the party train, so we already know that child needed, but we just let her uh, express herself and on the way, we go through the 
the um, school year, we just support whatever she needs with. But the most important is respect and make them welcoming and support them and let them know that we are there for them, whatever they need with. Okay. Ms. Vivian? Hello, hello everybody. I'm Vivian Levias Williams and I am an ECI working with the City of Oakland Head Start. And I'm gonna be talking about addressing or managing toilet training in the classroom. First, I wanted just to thank uh, Tasha, Tasha Jordan, because uh, what she said was exactly precise, creating a safe and strong and free environment, using positive language, helping children to feel safe in the class, safe and valued is very important. I, call, I used to call it my Aditi effect, because I had an Aditi who would always talk so positive to me and make me feel so special. I often envision her when I'm talking to the children, and I remember how it makes me feel, how it made me feel when she would be so proud of me. So uh, one thing that I found uh, for me when you're working with these post-pandemic babies that are coming in, a few of them are uh, a, pretty much behind and a lot of the uh, social skills and, and self-help skills. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I, I always observe the child first and I make sure that they can walk and talk and go to the toilet, make sure they can pull their pants up and down and uh, stay dry for a little while if they understand and how, how to follow directions, just basic ones, and if they can communicate and say some of their needs at least, and um, even if they just seem interested in using the toilet and, and wearing underwear, if you answered yes to just a few of those questions, you can move on to the next level. <laughs> At that point, uh, I always start to, then I start talking with my co-teachers and make sure that we are prepared to start working with that child because it will take a lot of time, consistency, and support. Then after that, you can start preparing your equipment, getting everything ready. That means talking to the parents, making sure, uh, like like um, Miss Vicky was saying, getting them feeling like it's okay to get those underwear in. Don't worry about the laundry. I'm not worried. If it's okay with you, even if we got to borrow some more pants, it's just pants it's just clothes so we can do that because the parent was very worried about the child being wet or cold or anything like that and I was I had to keep saying to them it's gonna be okay it's all right we're just gonna work with them and uh and at that point then you after if, if if you can get once you get all of that stuff together make sure you have everything in place then you can start working with that child telling them what you're going to be doing. We're going to start going to the bathroom. We're going to schedule those bathroom breaks. And when it's time to go to the bathroom, we're going to go. And so uh, for me, uh, scheduling the breaks, I had to start because I'm old now. So I had to start setting my timer. And when that timer goes off, then the child's looking at me and they're like, it's time to go, right? Yes, it's time to go to the bathroom. Those scheduled potty breaks, those those really worked for me in the classroom but uh, you know and I always uh, tell the teachers that I'm working with expect accidents don't make a big fuss about them just be positive because uh, that child is looking at you and they want to they're gonna you know that you want them to stay feeling positive so you don't want to start making any negative connotations about uh, about different things you also want to start talking to them about what you're going to be calling the uh, the the bathroom breaks, you know, the, the name that you're going to be using, because you don't want to start using words like stinky and dirty and so forth like that. And, uh, you know, because we want also to just continue to uh, individualize with that child creating a yes environment, allowing them the opportunity to do as many self-help skills as they can do, uh, allowing them to go with uh, the other children to the bathroom to see what that's about, other potty trained children, so they can see what that's about and get nice and comfy in that bathroom. Also, um, giving them a chance to sit on that potty and, and just feel what it's like. And uh, another big thing post-pandemic 
uh, before we weren't even letting the parents in the building. But now that the parents can come in, it's very helpful to me. And I, I saw that it was comforting to the child and I forgot what that was like uh, uh, until just recently. And uh, inviting them to come on in and take them to the bathroom, let them see where the bathroom is and let, let the child uh, go in with their mom and so that they can start getting comfy in that area. And that will really uh, um, deflate a lot of that anxiety that they have towards going to the bathroom. Also, just praise every effort that they make not just the successes. Every time they go in there, each time that they uh, are able to pull their own pants off and put the pants back on again and just stay as positive as you possibly can because at the end of the day, everything's going to be all right. That's all I had to say about post-pandemic body training in the classroom. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you to the two of you for such insightful potty training strategies and keeping it child centered, right? It's always going to be okay. It's just closed. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I hope that was really helpful for you, for you all as well to hear it. So we'll have a few minutes to take your questions for our speakers. Um, you can use a raise hand feature on Zoom. You could put your questions into the chat. Um, and I think we're able to take two questions. So don't be shy. This is your time. Put it into the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. Your questions could be for any one of our speakers. How do you deal with a negative parent? Um, this question comes from Nicole Boston. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about exactly where are you facing this kind of negativity? If you want to unmute yourself, Nicole. But what I will- Hello. Oh, there you are. <laughs> How are you doing? Great. Thank you for uh, being with us. Oh, no problem. I love um, taking trainings that do with children to teach me more. Mm -hmm. um, well, the negative is um, I have this parent. Um, she has this, uh, I guess he's special needs, but he's like, he's very active and he wants attention all the time. And well, the parent, she comes in and it's like anything that teach. I just began um, working there about maybe two or three months. And I've noticed her every time she comes into class, she's complaining about the teachers are not doing this for her child. Um, like say like at breakfast, they're sitting there eating and the kitchen brings out cereal, milk. She wants him to have uh, pancakes or something else. And that's all we have. And she said, well, I'm just going to take him out of here. And, you know, we said, that's okay. You could take him and just come back. You have to sign him out. I'm not signing him out. And it's just everything. She, when she comes in, everyone's filled the negative energy she brings. And it, her child's acts on that. You know, he runs around the class, he's throwing stuff. And I'm wondering, how do we approach that parent without making her feel bad? you know, trying to help her because we're supposed to be supporting the parents too. Of course. Yeah, that's frustrating. We have yes. some great panelists today and I'm wondering thoughts, what those thoughts might be. Um, I think there's a lot of um, approaches one can take, but my first question would be, um, how are you and the staff working to build a relationship with her outside of this? Um, when you mentioned that her child may have disabilities and um, may have some challenging behaviors, 
I kind of put myself in the role of that parent. Like you right. all have expertise and knowledge. And so you yes. have some ways of coping and, and figuring out how to support the child. But, you know, parents, it's like, good luck. You know, you have yes. a kid, you don't really know. You know, you kind of do the best you can. Right. And so I would wonder, you know, has anybody reached out to this parent, you know, when she walks in and says, hey, you know, do you have a few minutes? I just want to check in and see how you're doing, you know, show you some stuff here, like just kind of relationship building, because sometimes negativity, mm -hmm. anger, you know, mm -hmm. all of that can actually be a defense mechanism where she may yes. be feeling like, I feel bad and embarrassed that my child is like this. So now I'm mm -hmm. going to kind of lash out first. So I think okay. that's one thing I might offer to just kind of mm -hmm. check in and not to give feedback about the child, literally to say, right. you're welcome here. We want to know who you are. We want to build a relationship with you. Um, that's okay. just one place I might suggest. I think there are many others as well. Other panelists might have ideas. Um, yes. And what you're saying is true because she comes in angry. And, and I'm like, why is she coming in angry? And then it's like, since I'm the newcomer and, you know, I welcome in her son and her, her, the other cousin with the sister. And I say, oh, good morning. How you doing? And she's just looking at me. She turned her head, didn't say anything. And, but the sister said, oh, good morning to you. But it's like her sister is, it's just anything. People can be nice to her. Good morning. How you doing? She won't say anything. It's like, she's angry at everything. We try to you know, the teachers that do the helper, but if she get upset, she'll go to the director, you know, and then I'm, you know, we're trying to tell the director, um, what are we supposed to do if she doesn't want to have nothing to say good to the teachers? It's just you she talks to. She don't, don't talk to the teachers at all. Yeah. Just remember that um, there's some people that believe anger is not the, a true emotion, that anger is a proxy for other emotions yes. like fear, anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of things. So, um, okay. yeah. so I think having a conversation with the director would also be important about how okay. she is building a, or he is building a relationship um, with the parent as well. So thank you for asking your question. Thank you. Yes. Great question. We'll take one more uh, potty related question from Maria Gallo. We have a lot of children who recently, um, who recently are poop holders, quote unquote, and parents put them on Miralax. Any thoughts on encouraging poop holders? Our potty experts, Ms. Vicky. Uh, I think they should consult the doctor because that's that's not a safe way to um, to do that. Also, like I said, you, you you really need to make sure they're getting enough water in the daytime and fruit. Because, and uh, if they're not pooping on their own, that that's a um, you know that's a, a bigger issue than um, than that. But uh, just making sure that you're creating a safe environment for that child and uh, and that they feel comfortable going to the bathroom. A lot of times. Um, you know they maybe if they have to keep the pull up on they just have to keep the pull up on that's just it thanks much all right so we are going to move on to our breakout rooms so it's about that time what we're going to do is you're going to have a facilitator in your breakout rooms to lead you through some questions and we're going to meet back here to close up our evening at 7 55 so diana if you could please launch the breakout rooms
All right, I see everybody is teleporting back into the main room. Okay, so welcome back all. If your interpretation is turned off, please reselect the language that you would like um, to continue participating in. Thank you all for showing up and having this energizing discussion with us. Um, I know the small groups were pretty lit. Um, I learned a lot and I hope that everybody else did. Uh, we really appreciate you spending your Wednesday evening with us, especially in this like-minded group that cares about Oakland's youngest children. So we're going to be sending out an email with a meeting evaluation form. Please fill it out. We want to get your feedback so that we can continue to tailor these symposiums to be as important to you um, as they can be. The email will also include your professional development certificate for tonight and also any resources that were shared by our speakers. But before we conclude, I want to be sure to thank um, the Raynan Foundation, Tandem Partners in Early Learning, the Packard Foundation for supporting this uh, symposium, and I want to thank all of our wonderful partners who helped plan this event. Of course, Oakland Starting Strong and Smart staff, our interpreters, our speakers, our small group facilitators, myself, Vince. So um, thank you all for being here, and we hope to see you on Saturday at Bananas, 10 to noon. Roll through. We'll be there all uh, from 10 to 2, not all day. Bye, all. Thank you. Have a good night. Hey, Marvin. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You all have a good night. Hey, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Adiós. Buenas noches. Adiós. Buenas noches. Adiós. Bye. Bye.